What's going on, Fabus? Good morning, fellow mathematicians. Welcome back to another video. Today we are going to do something extremely exciting in my opinion. This right here is the first video on asymptotic expansions and they are really important. So those things are so nice to use in numerical analysis, analysis in itself in so many branches of mathematics. And today we are going to derive one of the most important in my opinion, the asymptotic behavior for our boy the gamma function called Stirling's formula. Just a regular one without those advanced error terms in the back. So at first let me define what we understand by asymptotically equal. So imagine you have two functions, for example z factorial and the thing we are going to derive today. What you want to do? We want to take the quotient of those two. So let's say we are going to take the limit f z approaches infinity in this case. So we want to take a look at this function for bigger and bigger values of z. And like I said, we want to take the quotient of z factorial. And this thing we are going to evaluate today, let's say f of z. And in the limit, what we want to have, we want to go to one. Okay, so what we want to find, we want to find a function which is really nicely approximate to our original function in the limit for bigger and bigger values of z in this case. f of z is going to be Stirling's formula today. Okay, so asymptotically equal just means that the error between those two is going to get smaller and smaller in the limit. And why not just start with our boy z factorial right here, okay? We are going to give it a shot and then we are going to work from there and we are going to find a nice approximation of this thing. We know that z factorial is nothing but, okay, the, the pi function of z or just gamma of z plus one. Okay, you can just make use of the recursive definition right here of the gamma function. It's just how it's defined. We have derived it before. Take a look into the description for all the definition stuff. Now we know that this thing right here is exactly equal to a certain integral, namely the one from zero to infinity of, let's use t as the integral variable, t to the z power times e to the negative t dt. Okay, this has been the first step. Nice and easy. What we want to do now is, okay, I want to give a little motivation for why we are introducing a certain substitution in a minute. And also note that we don't want z to be equal to zero right here, just because we are going to take a look at the limit as z approaches infinity. Okay, we are going to do a limit Hadoken to infinity right here. I'm going to rewrite t to the z power as nothing but e to the ln of this thing, okay? Then we are going to have an integral from zero to infinity of, I drop my chalk, e to the ln of this thing is nothing but e to the z times ln of t. Also, <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. Also, we have this nice function equation on the exponential function in the real numbers and the complex numbers that e to the something times e to another something is e to the something plus this other something, okay? So we are going to get e to the, okay, we are going to have this part, z times the natural log of t. Take a piece of paper, try it out for yourself. It's pretty easy what I'm doing here, okay? Integrated with respect to t. This is what we have right here at the moment. Later in the game, we want to find a nice approximation for our natural log right here. And since looking at Maclaurin series expansions is going to be way easier than taking a look at Taylor series expansions just because you are going to rid of you're going to get rid of this um, x naught term that you have in Taylor series expansions. What we want to do? We want to substitute t by some I don't know one plus x in some way. Okay, but it's not ending there. If we would just substitute this. By that, this term right here with the t is going to be without a z. And we want to take a look at the asymptotic behavior of this function right here with respect to z in some way. So what we also want to get is a z right here such that we can kind of factor out the z up here and take a look at the new function and see how it's um, acting asymptotically. So why not multiply 1 plus x by a z 
Okay, it's just going to help right here. Now, what are we going to get? Well, at first, dt is going to be, okay, if we differentiate this with respect to x, we are going to get z times tx, leaving us with, those are just side notes. Now, an integral from. Okay, if we plug zero into here in our t, we are going to have zero being equal to this. We don't want z to be equal to zero. We want to cover it at large values, meaning we can divide both sides by it. Meaning x plus one is equal to zero, meaning x is nothing but negative one. If t goes to infinity, we want z to be some fixed big number, not being infinity at the moment, okay? It doesn't do any good in the substitution, meaning our x needs to go to infinity, okay? It's just a big number right now, okay? It's just a fixed number z right here at the moment. Then we are going to get e to the z, natural log of this chunk right here, okay? Um, if we have this chunk, so natural log of a times b, this is the same as natural log of a plus the natural log of b, meaning this is z times the natural log of 1 plus x, and then plus z times the natural log of z. Okay, what else do we have? Okay, we have negative this chunk right here. Let me distribute a bit of stuff. So we are going to have negative z times this chunk. We can distribute the z into everything. So we have negative z minus z times x, okay? Integrated with respect to x. Now we have a lot of stuff right here. So what can we observe? Well, basically we have those x terms all with a z right here. This is where we wanted to get at. We want to take a look at a certain function then, how it acts in the limit actually. Okay, also we have this e to the z times ln of z. This is the same as ln of z to the z power e to the ln of something is just a something in itself. So this is going to give us z to the z power. Okay, I'm going to put it here. Also, we are going to have um, e to the, okay, I totally forgot the z right here on the dx. I'm terribly sorry. We have the z term right here. We can put it together with this plus one. Okay, this is just this term. Also, we have e to the negative z that we can bring to the outside, okay? Once again, using this functional equation stuff I talked about before. Times the integral from negative one to infinity of e to the, okay, now we have a z term right here, common on both of those, times natural log of one plus x minus x integrated with respect to x. We came pretty far already. So the only thing that we really need to take a look at is this right here now, okay? And this is quite easy to handle if you get where we are going to go at. Also, this thing right here is already a huge part of Stirling's formula, so, so this is already half the job done. Now we need to do some uh, intuitive analysis on this thing right here. You would rigorously justify it with dominated convergence theorem by introducing a little uh, dominator, but we are going to do it intuitively. Maybe you are going to find a little Desmos thingy at the end where I talk um, to my computer a bit. <laughs> we are going to give this thing right here a name. For example, this thing right here is just some function g of x, okay? g like function. I hope this does make sense. Now we are going to take a look at g at our endpoints right here because we are going to approximate this thing right here asymptotically to some other integral in a minute. So this is the basic thing you are going to do. Like I said, dominated convergence theorem. And this is where we take, this is why we have to take a look at the endpoints right here for us to actually see how it acts at the endpoints. So now g of x is nothing, but I'm going to write it out. The natural log of one plus x minus x. How is this going to help? Okay, what can we actually say about this function? Well, why not take a look at x approaching infinity? So the upper bound right here. So our case one for x going to infinity and x being not equal to zero, being really bigger than zero right here. Okay, at first I want to take a look at this thing right here. In one of my advent calendar videos, I actually discovered a fact and I proved it there that e to the x is strictly greater than one plus x. Okay, this is something I have used there. Why not take the natural log on both sides? Meaning the natural log of e to the x is just x being greater than the natural log of one plus x. Meaning if we subtract x on both sides, then zero is bigger than exactly g of x right here. Meaning our g of x in the positive reals is always less than zero, okay? Meaning 
g of x is going to be negative. Now, we are going to have a negative number right here. z is going to be really big in the limit. As z approaches infinity, we are going to have e to the negative infinity, meaning this integrand actually goes to zero. So if we take a look at our graph, it somehow looks like this right here, okay? It's going to go to zero in the limit. So g of x goes to zero then. What can we say about the lower bound right here? Negative one. Well, for this, I would just like to take a look at the graph of our natural log and our x compared, okay? This right here is our natural log and this is right here is our x. And you see, once we are down one and we are going to get smaller and smaller, we are going to take a look at the case right now where um, our x is between zero and one. On this interval, our natural log is going to go downhill pretty fast. Meaning, if we have the natural log of one half, for example, this is negative the natural log of two. So natural log being less than one is going to go into the negatives. And natural log grows way faster to negative infinity than our x actually does. Meaning overall, g of x is going to be negative once again in this branch right here. Okay, this is just something we can observe. So, so if you plug zero into here, this is the natural log of one and from there it's going downhill, okay? Just because our x can't really keep up with our natural log, g of x is going to be negative all the time. Just by the same argumentation as before, if we let z approach infinity, we are going to get e to negative infinity somehow, okay? Point is that this is a negative number and this in the limit goes to zero once again. So our graph on this side, this right here is one, this is our lowest point, uh, negative one, this is our lowest point, looks like this right here. Okay, what is going to happen if we are at zero? Okay, so this is the only case we really haven't covered. We always said that our x is away from zero. What happens if our x is actually equal to zero? For x, going to zero. What are we going to get? Well, the cool thing is we can actually approximate our natural log using its Maclaurin series expansion. I have made a video on that. Take a look into the description. There's probably a link to the corresponding video. Meaning our g of x can be written as, okay, at first we have negative x plus the sum running from one to infinity. That's a nice infinity boy right here of, okay, natural log is exactly um, negative one to the k plus one power, x to the k power over k. Meaning, if you write this out a bit, then our first term is going to be, if you plug one into here, negative one squared, okay, that's just positive one, x to the first power over one is just x. So our first term is actually going to cancel out with our negative x, coolio. Second term is going to be negative, okay, negative one to the third power, x squared over two, so negative x squared over two. And after that, we are going to have a lot of terms, infinitely many actually. And those infinitely many terms are of the form something x to the third power or higher. We are going to denote this by big O of x to the third power. Meaning this thing right here has an, asymp has an asymptotic behavior, I'm terribly sorry, like x to the third power and higher decrease. Meaning, <laughs> he here comes the really nice point of approximations. If we go to zero, well, those terms with x to the third power, basically, I, I mean, if you have zero dot, dot one already to the third power, this is zero dot zero dot zero dot one. And if you have even higher powers, they are going to be closer and closer to zero. And the more and more we go to zero, those are going to get arbitrarily close to zero, okay? They are going to go somehow to zero, meaning we can actually approximate our g of x as being nothing but negative x squared over two. And the cool thing is, if we let z approach infinity, okay, we are going to have e to the negative infinity once again, just because no matter which value for x we plug into here, it's going to be positive once again, okay? x squared is always positive in the reals, meaning we are going to get something negative. This goes to zero in the limit once again. So what we can basically do, we can approximate our integrand that we have right here. 
this integrand as nothing but e to the negative z times x squared over 2. This is just due to the fact that this integrand kind of approximately acts like this integrand right here, okay? So both are kind of equal in the limit when z goes to infinity. This becomes way more clear when you take a look at um, Desmos, for example, if you compare the graphs. I'm, I'm going to make a little video on that. Um, you can find it at the end of the video. I'm running out of space right here. I'm going to erase everything. I hope you could follow everything I said up until now. All that's really left to do is then, after substituting our new integrand in, to take a look at the upper and lower bounds. We want those upper and lower bounds to kind of act like our original upper and bounds once again. Okay, give me a second. We are actually close to being done. There's nothing really left to do right here. Okay, so we have gathered all of this. Now, what are going to be the new lower and bounds on this new integral? So at first, let us observe that this z factorial is kind of equal, approximately equal, up to some error term to, okay, this is what it means to be asymptotically equal, to, okay, this chunk right here, z to the z plus one power, e to the negative z, and then some integral with upper and lower bounds, e to the negative z, x squared over two, integrated with respect to x. Now, we have drawn the graph before, like I said, the Desmos plot is going to become more apparent. It looks something like this. Now, if we take a look at x squared over 2, this, this integrand right here, so e to the negative x squared over 2, kind of. Looks something like this right here, okay? Now, our upper bound looks pretty good. It already looks approximately like this thing right here, okay? So, to infinity. But, what about our lower bound? So, if we would just go to negative 1, that's not really close. But, in the limit, we can take it up until negative infinity because if we increase the value of our set right here, this is going to get smaller and smaller. It's going to look something like this right here. It's going to become way closer to this thing. And this right here at, at negative one was approximately something like this right here. Okay, and then we have this line basically. So nothing happening there anymore. So it's kind of a matter of intuition right here and also pure mathematics in itself, so um, I don't know how I can explain it any better than that, but it's, I mean, for me, it's making sense. It does make perfect sense right here that we should approximate it from negative infinity to infinity. Maybe someone in the comments has something to say about this. And also this thing right here is way easier to compute, okay, than something from negative one to infinity right there. So we're going to take a look at this right now. And that's quite easy to compute because I have made videos on that. Now we are going to get, um, okay, we are going to substitute this up here, this z times x squared over two by let's say u squared because we want to get the Gaussian integral out of this. Meaning overall that if we um, take the square root on both sides, for example, we are going to get the square root of z over two times x is nothing but u. Okay, in normal case, absolute values, but we are just going to take a look at the positive branch right here. It's absolutely warm in here. It was raining out there and now it's really whew, schwül in here, like you would say in Germany. Also, we can differentiate both sides with respect to um, u and x. No, with respect to x, respectively. Okay, that's implicit differentiation, meaning that du is nothing but square root z over two dx. Okay, meaning we can take the reciprocal of that. dx is nothing but, okay, it's not equal to zero. I hope you can see where this comes from. Square root two over z du. We can plug this chunk into here. So this right here is actually equal to z to the z plus one power e to the negative z. And then we are going to get, okay, this chunk we can actually bring to the front. Square root two over z and then integral from negative infinity to infinity. Up and lower bounds stay as they are. I hope this becomes quite clear right here if you let the limits approach. Um, infinity and negative infinity, respectively. We are going to, um, yeah, right. Um, we are going to get e to the negative uh, u squared integrate with respect to u. I'm terribly sorry, I was just thinking about something. Okay, now, this right here is nothing but square root of pi, okay? 
um, this is just how it is. This is square root of pi. I have made videos on that. Meaning, we can bring the z to the first power in here, making the square root of 2 times z. Also, we have the square root of pi, leaving us with z to the z power, e to the negative z, square root of 2 times pi times z. And this right here is actually Stirling's formula. We are done with this. So, um, like I said, studying asymptotic behaviors is kind of um, an intuitive thing. So you just see it. And if you take a look at the plots, it's, it becomes really apparent why you have to choose stuff how we did right here. That's a nice little proof I actually uh, um, found in Dr. Tarkanov's script right here at the University of Potsdam. I didn't come up with this. This is just a well-established result in analysis. But yeah, um, thank you Dr. Tarkanov for this thing right here. This is Stirling's formula and it's important with it. You can prove, for example, the Gauss multiplication formula. We are doing this a different way. Maybe I've already done videos on that. But yeah, um, I'm going to see you in the Desmos plot that I'm going to put at the end of the video. And I thank us for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and recommend the channel. If you like better seats, like, right, click on the core request that I post from time to time. Support channel on Patreon. I'm until the next video. Have a sterling day, my boys. See ya. What's, uh, what's going on, smart nibbles? Uh, sterling the formula this. Like I said, we are going to take a look at some Desmos stuff. And... I would just like to make my point clear, okay? At first, I would like to take a look at the weird graph, okay? That we have derived this e to the um, f of tau times z, okay? This is the z graph. And if we start at z being equal to zero, that's something we didn't want, if I remember correctly. Let me see. Uh, ah, never mind. It really doesn't quite matter. If we start at one, this graph looks really quite weird, you see? Um, but it's still what you would expect. So... It starts somewhere at negative 1, and then it kind of curves like the exponential function would, like the bell curve, okay? But what happens if we go to um, 5, for example, okay? Oh, it looks more and more like the bell curve. And the right-hand side and left-hand side nearly have the same slope already. What about um, z being equal to 100? Oh, that looks good. That looks nice and symmetrical around the y-axis. Okay, so this is something that we have right here. And if we just take a look at a regular bell curve, you might notice that it looks like the regular bell curve. Oh my goodness, Papa, that's so obvious. Yes, I know. Thank you. So <laughs> if we compare those two, what can we see? Well, they look actually quite different. But we wanted to see how they behave asymptotically for the limit as z approaches infinity. Well, this is 1. Now, what about 10, for example? Oh, that looking good. That looking thick, mate. They are kind of shifted a little bit, but, but it's getting better. It's getting better. What about 50, for example? Wow, boy, bruh. It's, it's getting really good. Look, they are nearly kissing each other already. But what about, for example... um. Wow, 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 they are getting closer. They are kissing each other, but really hard. Okay, up here they they already have the same um, Y intercept and whatsoever. That's what you would expect. But down here, oh, it's, it's getting absolutely wild. And for bigger and bigger values, they get closer and closer together. And you, now you might notice, maybe, that if we increase this, for example, to a huge limit, 10,000, that, well, they are getting really close together. Okay, so um, let me uh, shift this around a little bit. Whoa, 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 it's going berserk, it's going berserk. Oh, can can you see that? And in the limit, they are going to approach one. They are going to have the same asymptotic behavior. I can't even zoom in anymore such that we can see the difference. Yeah, here you can see a slight difference, okay? But uh, now you maybe uh, might see my point. So at the end point, our um, graph actually um, um, acted like our real Gaussian bell curve, like our Gaussian bell curve, okay? It goes to zero in the limit. But right here, we already have a zero, so this natural log is doing a pretty good job right here. Okay, this has been just the asymptotic behavior, and now I want you guys to see um, Stirling's formula in action. We have our um, x factorial right here. You know this curve, okay? That's the nice and sweet gamma function, the continuous um, version. And now, let us activate Stirling's formula. The Stirling's formula we have derived is only really doing a good job in the positive reals, okay? That, that's something you would expect. And down here, you are getting a really rough approximation. I mean, it's really good, but there's still an error. But the, 
or we go upwards, okay? The more our limit approaches infinity of our x value, getting close and close together. Let us take a look at, um, I don't know, what is this up here? What, what is this? That's for example 4, okay? Going to go pretty hard already to 24, but they are pretty close to each other. So, um, yeah, my dog is making weird noises. Um, I hope this clears up a little bit um, of the doubts or whatever you had. So this right here has been Sterling's formula. Um, I hope you did enjoy this video. Please like, subscribe, recommend channel. And, uh, see you guys. Love you. Mm -hmm.